Welcome to Damn Good Movie Memories with your host, Ryan Davis. This podcast is the cure for your long commute and super boring work day. Get ready for the thrill of your life. Now, Universal plunges you into a mystery at the speed of sound. Roller coaster. An accident in California. Last two accidents in one week. Who's putting the lid on this? The police? A recording from a stranger. Get on the ride, Harry. A drop in Virginia. Harry. Yeah. Remember what happens when you don't follow directions. And a man in the middle on the ride of his life. They're over the lift. It's too late to stop them now. Let's go. Hey there, it's Brian Davis, and for this week's episode, we're going to cover the movie Roller Coaster from 1977. The studio was Universal Pictures, release date was June 10th, 1977. The running time, 119 minutes, and was rated PG. Now, here's one that I saw on TV as a kid, along with other disaster-style films of the 70s like Earthquake, The Towering Inferno, and others. Roller Coaster, in particular, kind of felt like an episode of Chips, or a police show of the era. And since I'm a sucker for those types of shows, even today, this was going to be right up my alley. All right, let's get into the making of the film. So writer and producer Tommy Cook used to love roller coasters when he was growing up. And while he was traveling, he would often seek out the various local amusement parks. One day, he saw a news article about the last of the giant wooden roller coasters. Now, this was the Giant Dipper, which was located at the Santa Cruz Beach Boardwalk, the same location where The Lost Boys was filmed. He traveled to Santa Cruz and went on it constantly that day, and he decided that he had to write a story about roller coasters. His story idea was about an ex-military guy who was in charge of munitions and explosions. However, when he leaves the service, he can't find a job or make a living. He decides that if non-military life won't allow him to work, he'll take his skills he learned and use that against them. He decides to create an explosion on a roller coaster and then go to all the amusement park owners to be paid to avoid further destruction. After getting Universal to pick up the story idea, writers Richard Levison and William Link were hired to write the screenplay. The duo was known for their work on the hit TV series Columbo with Peter Falk. All right, let's get into the film. So sadly, there are next to no audio clips available for this film, but frankly, even if there were, they might not be the best for an audio-only podcast. That being said, the film does open with the message about how the film is presented in Sensoround, which was created to enhance the audio portion of key scenes so that you can feel the audio. Kentucky Fried Movie sort of made fun of this with a skit, though it was for an adult theater. <laughs> the other movies that use its sense around in theaters were Earthquake, no surprise there, Midway, and the film version of Battlestar Galactica. The film opens at an amusement park in Norfolk, Virginia, while the crew gets the park ready for the day. Prior to the park opening, we see a mysterious young man. This is Timothy Bottoms, and he's wearing a park uniform and placing a device on one of the big roller coasters called the Rocket. Since the Timothy Bottoms character is never given a name, he's only the quote-unquote young man, we'll just call him Tim for the sake of recognition for the episode. Tim casually walks around the park, carefully scanning everything, but especially the rocket. Tim also does very well at the Markspin games and wins a stuffed animal. He buys some cotton candy, but never once speaks to anyone. After a number of runs for the rocket, the moment of truth for Tim finally occurs as the tension builds up, as we sense the impending doom, for the unfortunate passengers of this specific ride. The tension is terrific, along with the score up to the moment the coaster reaches the point where Tim planted his device. Tim casually throws away his cotton candy, pulls out a remote control from his jacket pocket, flips a switch, waits for the right time, pushes the button, and part of the track explodes. By the way, the score in this film is fabulous, and with good reason. It was done by the great Lalo Schifrin. He was best known for his music in The Exorcist. 
But he also wrote the original Mission Impossible theme, along with scoring films like Cool Hand Luke, Bullet, Coogan's Bluff, and the Dirty Harry films. What's kind of genius about Tim's little explosion is that it only destroys a small section, but that's enough to derail the coaster. Tim doesn't even bother to watch the coaster hit the bent metal, then derail, and then crash into various parts of the park. Many people are injured, along with a number of fatalities. Now, originally, the roller coaster crash that kicks off the film was significantly more graphic, with flying bodies and gore as the cars derail and topple over. This sequence was toned down considerably to avoid an R rating. We then meet safety inspector Harry Calder, played by George Siegel, who's getting shock therapy in order to quit smoking. You can definitely see the inspiration that Ghostbusters had when Bill Murray had a similar scene in the beginning of that film. After a session, Harry gets a call from Simon Davenport, by Henry Fonda, that's his boss, about a coaster disaster in Virginia. Harry's on the hook because he inspected the park three months prior. Harry investigates and speaks to one of the workers who saw Tim on the track, but thought it was a normal maintenance guy. Harry speaks to Lieutenant Kiefer, played by Harry Gordino, who's the lead on the case. All the trains met the proper safety precautions and were checked thoroughly before the park opened. Harry believes that someone that wasn't part of the park may have tampered with the coaster, but they can't be sure yet. Of course, as the viewers, we know. Tim has now moved on to a different city. This is Pittsburgh, and another amusement park. This time, he caused a fire, but nobody was injured. We go back to Harry. He's divorced with single custody of his daughter Tracy, which is played by a very young Helen Hunt in her film debut. Harry's dating a woman named Fran, played by Susan Strasberg. That was Millie from the movie Picnic. Harry finds out about the Pittsburgh bombing and then travels to Chicago, where he hears about a number of amusement park executives meeting. The executives were sent a ransom cassette asking for a million dollars to stop the bombings. Unbeknownst to the men, Tim acted as a bellhop and placed a recording device in the room during the meeting. Harry meets with the executives and tells them to bring in the FBI to assist in catching the bomber. FBI agent Hoyt, played by Richard Widmark, is put on the case, but he doesn't seem interested in having Harry help them on the case. So Harry goes back home. Once he's home, Harry ends up receiving a mysterious call who leaves a cryptic message about needing a vacation. We can assume this is Tim who appreciates that Harry is the only one taking him seriously, after hearing the meeting with the executives in Chicago. After receiving the call, Agent Hoyt and his men arrive at Harry's house. They need his help after all, not because they want it, but Tim specifically asked for Harry to be the bag man in delivering the ransom from the executives. After the FBI leaves, Harry gets another phone call from Tim, and we find out why he's doing it. The reason is simple. He wants money. That's it. He doesn't really have any pleasure for hurting people, but this is the only way he can make a lot of money from corporations who won't miss it. Tim is completely calm, almost apathetic in the way he speaks about his plan. Harry then goes to Richmond, Virginia, per Tim's instructions, and receives detailed instructions from the FBI about the protocol they expect from Harry when making the ransom exchange. The drop is to be done at King's Dominion Amusement Park. Harry gets a phone call from a payphone at 11.30 a.m. precisely. Tim tells Harry to buy a custom-made hat, which has his name stitched on it. Tim wants to be able to identify Harry at all times. Tim also wants Harry to remove his wire and lets the FBI know that there's a bomb in the park. So Harry buys this ridiculous green bucket hat with his name stitched in and waits for the next move. Tim is at the top of the sky ride, which oversees the entire park. He even walks by one of the undercover agents who has no idea that Tim is right near him. A delivery boy then finds Harry and gives him a box. The box contains instructions where to go next, along with the walkie-talkie. Tim instructs Harry to go on a number of rides in order to keep him moving and making it more difficult for the FBI to track him. (laughs) There's a really funny scene where Harry plays a carnival game and wins a carton of cigarettes. Man, how times have changed. Harry ends up on the main roller coaster called The Rebel Yell, and we get the same ominous music as in the beginning of the film. Harry is nonplussed about being on the coaster and acts like he's sitting on a bus rather than an exhilarating ride. Tim makes Harry go on the ride again, and Tim enjoys the cat and mouse game, which confuses everyone as it seems pointless. Next is the sky ride. First, Harry, I think I should tell you about the bomb. Would you like to know where it is? You're holding it. Don't try to open it. There's a tamper switch. Don't throw it, Harry. So, what will Harry do? Well, you're just going to have to watch the rest of the film and find out. 
I will say that this film would have been better off being about 30 minutes shorter, which would have added more tension and briskness to the film. However, the acting is very well done and a very good cast of veteran actors involved in this film. For younger folks, there may not be enough action, but this is a really a slow burn film by design. It adds the tension, and I'd say the film is closer to a Hitchcock film rather than the plethora of disaster films from the 70s. In any case, I find the film enjoyable mostly for seeing how amusement parks looked in the 1970s, along with a great cast. And again, there's some terrific tension scenes at the end of the film. All right, some fun facts. So as I mentioned, this was Helen Hunt's film debut. It was also Steve Gutenberg's first film as he had an uncredited bit part as a messenger. Now, I didn't mention him because it happened later in the film, but the band Sparks has a number of songs that they performed live at Magic Mountain for the big finale scenes. However, a year before the film was released, both Tiger Beat and Sixteen Magazine reported that the Bay City Rollers would appear in this film. Sorry, it was Sparks. The band members of Sparks often say that their appearance in this film was the biggest regret of their career. The filmmakers were originally going to include a scene of Tim on the phone with his mother to sort of establish a motive behind his plot, namely to get the money from larger amusement parks that were forcing his parents' small family-owned amusement park out of business. The filmmakers decided that the movie was more suspenseful if the motive behind the young man's actions were actually never known. It would also keep the audience from sympathizing with Tim's situation. Two stuntmen were injured and went to the hospital from filming a roller car crash sequence. One of the coaster cars hurled from the roller track as planned, landing on the balsa wood set building below the roller coaster with five stuntmen on board, but two of them got injured. George Siegel was represented by the legendary super agent Sue Mengers. She was notorious for getting a better payday for her clients, and Mengers badgered Universal into paying Siegel $1 million for this film, the same amount he carries in the briefcase for most of the movie. Universal tried to hold off for as much as they can, but still paid him $750,000, which was his biggest paycheck ever at that point. There's a plaque at Magic Mountain commemorating the filming of Roller Coaster. To commemorate the recording of Roller Coaster that we're doing right now, we're going to have Samuel Wetz on to discuss this film. He wasn't even born yet, neither was I when this first came out, but I know he likes these offbeat... 70s films or 80s films that were, you know, decades before he was born. So let's hear about his experience watching this film recently, and then we'll return next week with yet another random movie from my DVD collection. Okay, we're back with Samuel Wetz, who, look, he, he, he's a man of every era, and I was thinking, well, what, what, could I, what could I throw at him that maybe he's never seen? And I'm thinking, 70s disaster films. So yes. welcome back, <laughs> welcome back, Samuel. Hey, Brian. How are how you doing, my friend? How I'm great. Hey, anytime we get to talk movies, it's a good day. So during mm -hmm. the 70s, there was these huge slew of disaster films. You had the Poseidon Adventure and the Towering Inferno and Earthquake and all the airport movies and many others. Uh, did you ever get into these types of films or, or am I introducing you to a whole whole new genre? Well, I was aware of these films, like these type of disaster films, but I was kind of more informed or more well versed with like the later ones that you saw in okay. the 90s. Yeah, especially mm -hmm. in the 2000s. Uh, to this day, we're still getting disaster movies about oh, yeah. volcanoes and tornadoes yep. and sharknadoes and all that stuff. <laughs> but I wasn't really aware of, like, the, you know, these type of disaster films, you know, like this. Or uh, I think Black Sunday is another yeah. one like that as well. And, Black Sunday but, is going to be very similar to a movie we're going to be talking about soon. So that's Oh, good. yes, 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 yes. Yeah. I heard about that. But mm -hmm. this one, though, this one caught my interest because it kind of, at least from the trailer, when uh, you first brought this movie to me, mm -hmm. I saw the trailers. It kind of reminded me of like an old kind of grindhouse kind of thing, kind of mm -hmm. deal, which uh, I love me some grindhouse movies. And mm -hmm. uh, the movie's not a grindhouse movie. Let me just let that be clear to some people who might be interested. It ain't no grindhouse right. movie, but, th but it's still a good movie nonetheless. So mm -hmm. don't think it's uh, the Switchblade sisters and all that <laughs> upset, which I love that as well. I love that as well. So, but it did but, have kind of a raw, a raw feel to, feel to oh, it. Oh yeah, yeah. And I thought, and the from the trailer I saw, which was a very old school trailer, seemed really cool nonetheless. And I love that, you know, kind of like, what's this person's deal? Yeah. Oh, what, <laughs> what 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 are they planning, or what is their intentions? Kind of deal. I always love those kind of movies. <laughs> 
So, like most of the mu- uh, those those films I mentioned from the seventies, they always had a big name in the cast. And so, in this case, for Roller Coaster, you had George Siegel, Richard mm-hmm. Widmark, Henry Fonda, and really yes. an up and coming young actor at the time, Timothy Bottoms. It was also Helen Hunt's like film debut. So, yes. how did you like the cast when 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 you saw all these guys? Oh yeah, it was a great cast. You know, I I love George Siegel, even though. Admittedly, I don't know a lot of his filmography. Uh, mm-hmm. Isaiah, again, showing my age here. I knew him as the as the grandfather from the Goldbergs. The Goldbergs. <laughs> That's uh, how 100%. I knew him. That's yep. how I knew him. So watching this, I'm like, man, I'm not used to him being. Even though, well, he is old. You can tell this man. That's the thing in the '70s. I realized a lot of people looked older <laughs> than they yeah. did. Like George Siegel looks like he's in his fifties by this mm-hmm. by the time he did this movie when. I think what was it when he passed? He was like in his eighties, I think, like mid mid yeah. mid to late eighties, something like that. So I'm like, mm-hmm. damn, he looks so old here. <laughs> but of course, you have a young Helen Hunt who yep. has that, who doesn't have a lot of dialogue and maybe not much screen time. But when she's on screen, it's very much like the typical, "Come on, Dad," you know, yeah, and all this stuff, like very typical teen girl kind of yep. dialogue. And then you have Peter Fonda in here. Who I don't think is Henry even Fonda. Up. Henry Fonda. See, I get them mixed yeah. up. I, I get these two no, mixed no up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got him in here who doesn't really have um, much screen time, I, I, I no. can recall. But when he's on screen, he's great. And then you have uh, uh, Timothy Buttons as a uh, young man, as they call yeah, him in the credits. Yeah. That, that doesn't really give the character a name. You just know him as young man, or I think <laughs> uh, I think on some trailer, I, they call him as the terrorist. Or the right. Young. He very much has a vague kind of motivation as to why he's doing all this. There's not really much. Yeah, of it. and we'll get into that because that's a good point. Uh, it, when I did the little kind of uh, synopsis that I always do before that, I just uh, called him mm-hmm. Tim because I'm not going to call him Young Man the whole time. But <laughs> yeah, that, that, it, yeah, that's just a very, uh, <laughs> very like you guys could give him a name or something. I mean, like yeah. give him something, like call him the terrorist or Young Terrorist or something. Yeah, I really say like yeah. my name is George uh, Reginald blah, 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 or something. <laughs> Well, it's funny you mentioned George Siegel, how you, you knew him as a certain phase of his career. I always think of like mm-hmm. Burgess Meredith because like depending what generation you came from, he could be three different things. If you grew oh, up yeah. like my grandparents era, like in the 40s, like you would know him from films. But then if you grew up in the 60s, my parents might remember him as, you know, the Penguin in the Batman yes. you know, series. And then if you grew up when I did, I always knew him as Mickey and Rocky. So if you've been around long enough, you know, different generations will know you as different things. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's a ton of actors like that. I mean, there's people like, uh, you know, Clancy Brown, who people know him oh, as yeah. the bad guy from uh, Highlander. Highlander. Yep. Oh, Hi- Highlander. And you have people my age who know him as Mr. Krabs from SpongeBob SquarePants. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Two yep. different things, but there you yep. go. You know? Yeah, which is great. I mean, that's that's the if, if you have a long career, that's a good thing. So, yes, um, yes. <laughs> one one of the really th- one of the things I really enjoyed about this film, and you kind of mentioned it, it was sort of up to the viewer to figure out why the bomber was doing it. It's never really explained. So, what is your theory about the bomber, and why was he doing this? I I was coming up with ideas like, okay, you know, because you I guess nowadays in movies they would give like some sort of backstory to why yeah. he's doing this. You know, you can maybe get the idea. Maybe he doesn't like amusement parks mm-hmm. or something, or he maybe something happened to him, and he has like some sort of grudge against like places to have roller coasters. You know, but at the same time, I think it's very interesting to keep it vague because there's sometimes where you get prequels or remakes to have an origin story or all this stuff mm-hmm. that you almost go like, man, that kind of defeats the purpose of why I love this character. Like. Halloween, yeah. for example, you know, there's not really much of an idea or like a like a sense of like, oh, this would make Michael Meyer who he is. You just know the dialogue from Donald Pleasant saying like he was pure evil, he had evil in his <laughs> eyes and all that. All right. You know, then the Rob Zombie thing comes out, the remake of it in, in 07, and it's like, oh, he did this because he uh, he had not have a good childhood. His dad was abusive, and uh, <laughs> his mom was a stripper and all that, and his sister was a right. slut. And he, he's like, I'm going to kill <laughs> of the antagonist. It's better if 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 each viewer has their own interpretation. I think that's perfect. Oh, yeah. I, I agree. Yeah. And I think you, uh, I will yeah. say, though, that it probably would have been fine if they gave him a backstory, you know, give him a reason why he's doing it. But it just kind of shows that, hey, it doesn't you don't even have to have a motivation. You just want he just probably just want to do it just for the sake of that's doing right. it and just to mm-hmm. get some money out of it. 
you know, yep. complete the country or whatever. Yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. That that absolutely could be it. Do you think this movie was a bit too long or was the pacing fine for you? No, no, it was fine for me. I didn't really feel it dragged on, you know, too much, mm-hmm. you know. You know, it, it very much, I will say, though, it very kept me engaged, especially the intense mm. moments where when he, he's um, when George Siegel's holding the suitcase and he's talking in the walking talkie and he's talking mm-hmm. and he's kind of looking around, see where he's at and everything and all that. And the music is real. When, when they show him uh, uh, Timothy Bunn's character, you hear like mm-hmm. almost this ring, 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 almost psycho mm-hmm. kind of. Good call. Like, not, that kind of sound cue, but, but it, which uh, kind of makes sense because um, if I remember correctly, they this movie kind of compared to like a Hitchcock film at times with the suspense Very much. And, and all that, which you could definitely, I mean, I mean Christ, the music cues like that, of course, you're going to get that kind of. Hitchcock kind of thing and the expense of it all very much is very Hitchcock. The pacing was like real fine to me. I didn't feel it dragged on, but the one time I would say it kind of dragged on and it's not really so much the the scene's fault. It was the stuff that was going on in the background Mm. because uh, I think it's when they go to Magic Mountain, the band Sparks is playing and you hear him play a song. Yeah, It seems like it goes on for like six minutes, but it's like maybe like a small period of time but like Jesus Christ, how many times are you going to say big boy? God damn. <laughs> God damn. <laughs> so but, I was going to mention that. this. I, so did you I not did. like the band Sparks or, or oh, was I like it them. like, okay. Oh, I like him. I like the band, you know. I do like some Sparks, even though most people just probably know them as for the, oh, that's a band that does this town ain't big enough for the both of us, you know, which right. that's probably most well and so. But they have a lot of different stuff, you know. They're very much kind of the, um, Proto, I want to say proto faith no more, but like you could tell bands like Faith No More, Devo, a lot of different bands were influenced by Sparks, you know, especially, especially the keyboards. Band. Oh yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. and they even they're still to this day they're still going strong too, and uh, they even have a documentary about them as well. And uh, mm. and uh, a little fun fact, I don't know if you know this, but I sure. read somewhere that originally they wanted to have Kiss. Yes, <laughs> but Kiss <laughs> said no. For at least according to what I read, they were like, "This is like the movie doesn't really uh, involve us all that much. We're just there for like a minute," and so Which, they turned it down. <laughs> of and course, the ironic actually, part. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Oh, the ironic part. They ended up being in Kiss meets you know the Phantom of the Park. Which I think was also at Magic Mountain, if I remember yep. correctly. Yes, it was. Yes, it was. <laughs> so they okay. ended up going to Magic Mountain anyway. It's just for a different thing yeah. entirely. Completely full circle. That's a good call <laughs> out. Um, okay, so what were some of your favorite scenes that you can remember? Oh, uh, all the tense stuff, all the suspenseful stuff with they go to all the different music parks. I mean, the first one, especially, mm-hmm. is probably my favorite because you don't know what's like, okay, what's going to happen here is the thing's going to explode is it going what's going to happen here and once you see the the track derail and yeah. the coaster goes on and clearly obvious dummies you know i can't fault them on that <laughs> yeah. clearly obvious dummies just crack yeah. oh that was i did not expect that i was like damn this movie's ever thrown off on a crazy start yeah <laughs> crazy start. but probably the one that's like Probably strong, strong favorite of mine is the whole scene when he's holding the suitcase. George Seals holding the suitcase and he's talking to the walkie talkie and he tells them, uh, uh, the walkie talkie you're using is a bomb. And mm-hmm. he's like, not throw it because uh, it might go off and everything. <laughs> you know, that scene is great as well. And, uh, and uh, just and just for, for shits and giggles, uh, the cameo from Steve Gutenberg. <laughs> oh, no, that's the right. Sure. <laughs> Even though he has one little line, one scene. In and out. I love that scene, too, because I do love me some Steve Gutenberg. Me, <laughs> too. Academy. That's right. Um, Mahoney is the best. Uh, yes. Is there anything you would have changed about Roller Coaster, the film? Um, I think the one thing I would change is, and not that the characters were, I hated the characters at all, but I feel like you didn't really need the wife and daughter in the movie mm-hmm. at all, or maybe mm-hmm. have them be in the at Magic Mountain. Because okay. it, Nothing really happens there. He just tells them to leave, and then that's it. They just leave. <laughs> Maybe given a backstory or a little bit more info to why the the antagonist is doing he's doing what he's doing, mm-hmm. but nothing much other than that. 
I'm trying to think it would be more violent, but I'm like, nah, I think the violence is fine where it's at. You know, it isn't really, there's not really a lot of violence in the movie. I mean, overall. Yeah, it's like you said, it's the Hitchcock part. It's it's what you don't see that makes the film. It's suspenseful yeah. because you don't know when but it's going to happen. I will say, yeah. though, the one thing I would kind of change to is they do make it seem like they go out of the way to kind of hide the villain for mm-hmm. a second. Like, they kind of hide sure. his face, not show a lot. And then also they just show who he looks like. I'm like, yeah. Is there was there a point into that or mm-hmm. I mean because he may seem like was he one of the cops or one of the people who were in the part of the investigation? You mm-hmm. know that would have been interesting. You know if they went ahead and did that, but you know that's the one thing I would change. Like maybe don't have this vagueness about the character like showing his hands and not showing Got his it. face and all that. Maybe that'd be the one thing I would change, but. For the most part, okay. I am fine with the film as is, you know. Uh, and lastly, are, are you a fan of roller coasters or, or and was what's your favorite amusement park? Oh, man. Uh, yeah, that's a good question, because, I mean, I didn't go to a lot of music parks when I was a kid. But when I did, I always went to those roller coasters. I always mm-hmm. did. <laughs> there was always, like, there's not one in particular, you know, because usually the ones I went to were all kind of local. Like the county sure. fairs and all that, fairgrounds. So there was this one roller coaster that I swear every time I rode it, I thought my head's gonna fall off. My head's gonna go <laughs> just gonna get go boop, knocked off like that. It just I just felt like it was gonna happen. Then never did. Never did. Never did. Well good, I'm glad. Because we, we knew you were you had to be on a podcast eventually. So yeah. Yeah, we, so, we won't yeah, so lose the you. world was telling me something <laughs> when it didn't do that. You know, and uh, and thank God I didn't ride those uh, one. There was a one ride too, and they, you see in the movie where the people are on swings and spinning around. Oh yeah! Thank God I never went on those. Oh God! Well, you Uh-oh. mentioned the county fairs. Those are like the most dangerous because you know, you're basically having carnies like you know <laughs> in charge of these things. Oh yeah, and believe me, there has been there was accidents <laughs> at mm-hmm. this fair. <laughs> I remember one time there was this one that was like this ride that kind of spun around a circle it was like a loop-de-loop uh-huh. and someone told me there was a kid who knows who he probably was like lying up like lying to me or something but he told me <laughs> oh there was a kid that fell out of that thing earlier today <laughs> what yeah i think he's dead thanks i'm not going on that ride well and that's what's interesting about this this 70s movie is like you know all the um, drama happens. It's very pre-internet. It's probably 30 years before the internet. And mm-hmm. a lot of this could have been avoided because people, if this would have been out on social media and whatnot to avoid certain things. But again, you didn't have that in the 70s. So, you know, Timothy Bottoms' character could get away with a lot of this stuff. Oh, yeah. And there was even like stuff that, I uh, forget what it was called. They made a documentary about this um, amusement park. Uh, mm-hmm. I think you might know what I'm talking about, too. It was this one that's like the, they consider like the world's dangerous amusement dangerous, park. Dangerous, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I forget the name of it, but that one was gnarly. That one mm-hmm. was gnarly. The stories I heard about that place. But uh, one thing I want to add real quick sure. is I love the surround sound. That Well, the kind of proto surround sound when you go on the roller coasters. Yeah. And the cinematography. Uh, I got I, I to see what the name of the cinematographer. However they shot this, shot those scenes were really cool. To a point where you almost see like, the camera almost like move a bit. <laughs> With the roller mm-hmm. coaster, how it was moving, but still it worked. Uh, let me see. What's his name? It's a cinematographer. So I can give him a, a shout because he, does, he deserves David it. David Walsh, which is crazy because he also uh, was in a uh, – he filmed an uh, Evil Knievel movie, which makes sense since he was a, such, such a stunt guy. Oh, he also nice. did Cleopatra J- Jones. He did Sleeper with Woody Allen. Um, nice. He did Silver Streak, which is a great one with Richard Pryor and um, – Gene Wilder. So yeah, nice. no, he he was legit. He did foul play. He, he had a good Oh, resume. nice, nice. Love yeah. me some foul play, and I love me some Cleopatra Jones. But that's a whole different yeah. story right there. <laughs> he also he also did a fun movie that Metal Mike and Bill Rosebear are, are going to do at some point called Johnny Dangerously. Oh, I know and Johnny Dangerously. Michael Keaton. Yes. Yep. Yes. I love that movie. <laughs> So good call out there. Good call. Out. As always, thank you so much, Samuel. This has been a lot of fun and and definitely check out this movie. Yes, yes. Cool movie. Cool movie with George Siegel. Uh, <laughs> can I guess your age? No, no. <laughs> I love that. I love yeah. that line. I love that line. No. <laughs> can I guess your age, mister? No. 
If you enjoy this podcast and are an iTunes user, please do the show a favor and head on over to the official iTunes page for damn good movie memories. Be sure to leave a rating and a review. This will allow the show to appear higher in the algorithm and spread the joy of this podcast to the masses. If you are not an iTunes user, you can still listen and subscribe on Podbean at damngoodmoviememories.podbean.com. Be sure to like us on Facebook under our Damn Good Movie Memories page. You can also listen to a limited number of episodes on YouTube. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode and be sure to tune in next week for an all new episode of Damn Good Movie Memories. 